Hello, Ben Shoot here with some thoughts on the vibrato on the violin. Um, I think to start we, we need a few uh, caveats, one of which is that um, vibrato is extremely personal. Um, of course there are as many vibratos as there are players, um, and actually probably many more. Um, but, but in thinking about what we want from the vibrato, it might help to consider the, the different types of vibrato or the different usages that vibrato can have. Um, one, one function of the vibrato can simply be to, to, to round out and, and deepen a pure sound. So, just to add that little bit of extra depth and roundness to it. And in fact, a lot of the, I'm thinking particularly of German violinists, of the generation after that's after increased vibrato usage really came into being. So um, Adolf Busch, Karl Flesch, um, I feel like a lot of them were using vibrato primarily in this way to, to just deepen and, and round the sound of the instrument. Um, another function of the vibrato can be to, to give the violin a, a very vocal, voice-like quality so that you're hearing oscillations like, like in a human voice. And sometimes vibrato can be used to um, accentuate, the, or not accentuate, but to enunciate the beginning of a note. Um, when I think of the, uh, the French violinists in particular of the, of the late 19th, early 20th century, um, Thibault, um, or Chrysler, even though he was Viennese, but, but trained in Paris, and, and you have this kind of a sound... with this little bit of impulse to get the note spinning. Um, and then I, I, another function that vibrato can have uh, is just simply to, to throw the sound more. I, I was working with a teacher um, a while back who, uh, in Beethoven Concerto of all things, he, he was suggesting that I widen my vibrato to, to quite wide in order to throw the sound um, out and, and above a, a modern symphony orchestra. So, uh, some permutation of all of those different possibilities, and to varying degrees, can account for literally limitless possibilities of vibrato, and, and accounts for just the, the, the diversity in the, of, of the sounds that we hear, and the fact that really vibrato is, is like a, a fingerprint. Um, you, can, you can very often hear players that you know well and say, oh, that's, that's so until I recognize the vibrato. Um, a, a second caveat, is that uh, usage and, and the, the ideal conception of vibrato has, of course, changed with changes in instruments and changes in repertoire. I mean, if you go back to the 18th century, you're going to find violins looking a lot more like this. You've got strings. Um, and if I were to play something like... Um, I mean, to, to my ear, that sounds a little bit ridiculous. Not, I don't just mean stylistically anomalous, but it just the, the instrument neither wants nor needs that kind of vibrato. Um, it requires much less to get a, a sort of vibrant uh, shimmer to the sound. Um, and, and apart from that, the, the kind of sonic ideal that these instruments ask for anyway is much more one of pure and kind of cavernous resonance that... Um, Whose, whose singing or sighing quality is achieved much more by, by release, articulations and releases in the bow. Um, something like... And then, of course, by degrees, instruments are changing. But even, even into the 20th century, um, violinists are still, even with the, the modernized instrument, are still, by and large, using plain gut strings in, into the early 20th century and, and a slightly different cut of bridge in order to accommodate that. So, so we really are, if you think of you know, a game like tennis, that is just, if you compare the, 
you know, the tennis rackets that would have been used in the mid 20th century, um, would, would small head wood rackets with some perhaps gut strings, um, with a, a modern large head titanium racket with, uh, with uh, synthetic synthetic strings. I mean, it's just it's just, tennis is a very different game because of it, and and so is string playing to, for for similar reasons actually. Um, but on the modern violin, what what is it that can? What are some considerations that can help us in the pursuit of everyone's own individual sound on the instrument? Um, and how can we can we tap into the the possibilities for for sumptuous sound that the instrument affords? Um, I think maybe a good place to start is a, is a recollection, a very vivid recollection I have from childhood of attending a symphony concert um, where there was a violin soloist playing the Walton uh, Violin Concerto, uh, which is a piece that Heifetz recorded marvelously. Well, not to say that Heifetz didn't record anything marvelously, but um, but it, it, it's a piece that that um, where the Heifetz stamp is particularly memorable, let's say. And I remember the soloist vibrating very intensely, um, very probably uh, definitely a wider vibrato than Heifetz used, and, and possibly even faster. It was very, very intense. And I remember watching it from the middle of the hall, and I was aware of the use of vibrato, but I didn't feel the kind of intensity that I felt from Heifetz, which was very interesting because there was a lot more motion happening in the left hand. And it's, and it's interesting that when you look at or, or listen to recordings of... Um, Elman, Tibor, these, these old players who were just known for this, this sumptuous, uh, lava-like, rich vibrato, their, their motions are actually quite small compared to most modern players, which is, which is interesting. Um, but it makes you think that there's probably not a one-to-one -one correlation between the intensity of left-hand motion and the intensity that the vibrato, the intensity of experience that one has because of vibrato. Um, so I think it's profitable to consider what are some things that account for this mystique in vibrato, that this um, something other than a one-to-one -one correlation between intensity of this and intensity of perception. Um, and I think to understand that, it's helpful to, to look at some ways that violin playing has, has changed um, over the years. And, and one, I th one important difference, I think, into the 20th century was, was the addition of the shoulder rest. And, and I think a shoulder rest is a, can, be, can be a very helpful tool. Um, I presently play without one. Um, I grew up playing with one. Uh, and I've come recently to think that, um, especially when you're playing things that are both acrobatic and ask a lot of the violin tonally, um, you know, a Brahms concerto, Tchaikovsky concerto, something where there's so much input into the violin that the beauty of the sound can kind of stand on the edge of the knife, uh, as it were. Um, I find a little bit of extra support can can be helpful, especially for someone like me. I'm, I'm rather it's a bit easier to see on this side because this side is already bolstered. Um, rather slight in here with a longish distance here. Um, so what I've I've got tucked under here at the moment, what I have is a a, a ski glove. That's me. Um, if you prefer a shoulder rest, excellent. Um, but one thing a shoulder rest can do, and very often. I think we're taught to do is, is that it, it stops all motion of the violin. It, it locks it into place here. And, and I, growing up, my assumption was you hold the violin here so that the left hand can just have unencumbered motion along here. Um, but when you look at the older players, it's, it's very interesting. Um, there are you know, videos of, of Tipo where there's a, this sort of an angle on the left hand, and you can, or, or, or even this angle, and you can see wonderfully that the left hand is supporting the instrument here. And, and Milstein actually... Um, advocates explicitly that, that the left hand should should uh, support the violin. And, uh, and goodness knows that didn't slow Milstein down at all. Um, and I, I find the same thing. I don't, I don't find it at all harder to navigate the fingerboard um, if, if the basic paradigm is one of having some left hand support um, of the instrument. What I do find that it does is it gives an extra um, fulcrum, so to speak, to the vibrato, an extra... Um, an extra lever motion. So, for example, if the hand is going back and forth freely, then the, the joint is somewhere down here, perhaps controlled a little bit from up here. But if there's left-hand support, you've added another hinge or joint, so to speak, somewhere in here. And so the effect is that the vibrato doesn't just go back and forth. It's almost as though it's going kind of in and out of the core of the pitch. And I find that to be really essential because if I if I just I mean I, I'm not saying that 
that a, a shoulder rest vibrato necessarily does this, but but in principle, if, if vibrato simply goes back and forth in an unfocused way, I mean, it's, it, that's not going to create a lot of intensity of sound. What does create intensity of sound, and what can be done with or without a shoulder rest, um, is, is when is when the left hand really locks into the core of the pitch, and then a, just a little bit of oscillation can can give a really uh, electrifying effect. I mean, the the analogy I sometimes use with my students is that if I want to if I want to move something, and you know, very often you'll have a piano in the studio, so that's a good visual aid. Um, you know, if I want to move this piano, if I just if I push along the top, right, that's not going to be a very efficient motion at all. If you want to if you want to move something heavy, right? You, you have to engage the core of it. You have to engage the, the bulk of the mass and then, then it will go. So I think if we're glossing over the, glossing over the pitch, we're not going to have much intensity in the sound, but if the bow and the left hand can really sink into the core of the pitch, then we can really, we can really move it, right? We can really, minimal, minimal motion will create maximal intensity. Um, one reason why I don't use a shoulder rest at the moment uh, and why I like the violin to have a little bit more freedom here is because of the freedom to, to move this way. Um, and you can see a lot of videos of, of you know, Heifetz, you know, because he has such an intense vibrato. You can see videos of him where the, you can see the violin moving like this. And, uh, and that has two effects. One is that the, um, the point where the sound is coming out is actually vibrating. Right? It, it, there's this kind of motion back and forth. So that creates a, a vibrating sensation. But it also creates a sort of bow vibrato. Right? So, so there's now this threefold thing going on. We have the left hand engaging the core of the pigeon, not vibrating just back and forth, but kind of in and out with, from, this, from this hinge that we've added here, which also shakes the violin a little bit. And, and creates a, a vibration from where the sound is coming from, as well as a vibration against the bow, which means with minimal motion, or instead in other terms, maximal purity of sound, we can also get considerable intensity of sound. Much motion will yield um, quite quite a quite a, a, an effect that's quite disproportionate. One would think to, to the amount of motion going in, um, and that that makes me think that vibrato actually is. And, and this applies to to um, the modern instrument, and it applies to period instruments as well. That when people talk about vibrato or or tremolo um, or the the close shake, as it's variously called. Um, I think, you know, when we today hear the term vibrato, we think, oh, oscillation of pitch. But I, I think the concept of vibrato or tremolo, uh, as it used, you know, the tremulant effect of, of vibrato, um, is much more of a holistic effect, uh, however it's gotten. Of course, in the Baroque period, they, they often would use bow vibratos of various sorts. Um, but but this, this sort of method that I've been talking about makes makes vibrato a, a holistic effect in, of the instrument in order to maximize both purity and intensity of vibrato. Um, so that's that's been helpful for me in um, in thinking about how to pursue the the violin sound that I want to try to capture. I hope it can be helpful for for others as well um, as we are engaged in the in the common pursuit really of of trying to to each find our own our own sound and and eke out the interpretations that we that we have in our minds. So um, it's always, a, I find it a joy to, to explore this thing, and I hope this is helpful for, for you all as well.